Here we go. Ew. I bought a farm. First one of 2024. Coming back around here. Yeah, it was about that time. We were kind of going back and forth. We've got a few hunter episodes in the hopper. And so it's like, well, you know, it's that time. Like, break out, break out, and I bought a farm. It's killing time. We'll circle back here. So. Yeah. Well, we've been talking about it enough kind of off air. So it seems natural that it's like, well, let's pull everybody into kind of what we're having from a discussion standpoint. And, you know, things that we're working on or things we're thinking about doing. And, you know, that's kind of the whole point of this this podcast series is, you know, so that people can follow along with what we're doing, whether it's right or wrong, right? It's just an example of this is kind of how we're doing things. And uh, we seem to be enjoying it. Probably probably a lot more wrong than right, you know, but, <laughs> but we're learning. I mean, that's, that's you know, the, that's why we're doing it when we're talking about it openly. So hopefully you can learn from our mistakes and capitalize on our, uh, on the successes. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so before we get started, Appreciate you guys being here, uh, whether you're listening on Spotify, Apple Podcast, uh, or YouTube. Um, we do appreciate you being here. Give us a like, follow, subscribe, whatever's appropriate for the channel. And, uh, you know, here we go. Here we go. Uh, so I don't know when we did the last I Bought a Farm podcast. I'm not quite sure. Nick, you know when you're thinking? It was last year, for sure. Like, I want to say like May. May of last year. May of last year. Probably, so probably something we probably like that. haven't even had a discussion on us buying an Illinois farm. We bought a farm. We bought a farm. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we did. That was the last one. No, actually. I think it's been after May. That, that was the last that one. That was we the did. last one. Yeah. We bought a farm. Yeah. Well, because okay. we closed on that farm in, well, well, we closed in September. September. When did we come under contract with that? Uh, Would have been July. July. Yeah, right around the 4th of July. Yeah. So that might have been the last time that we did it. I know we've talked yeah. about it on the Hunter side, and I, I'm sure a lot of people listen to this or have listened to those podcasts, but... You know, from a standpoint of like getting into like nitty gritty numbers, plans for the farm and stuff, we didn't really talk too much about that um, on some of those podcasts. So yeah, or truthfully, I can't recall like the, uh, as far as the nuances of of how we got into that farm and mm -hmm. like some some deals that we've struck up with the farmer and stuff since then. A lot of moving pieces, uh, and we've killed deer off of them, right? So I mean, yeah. successful kind of start to finish. You know, uh, the only thing you know left would be uh, the evolution of the farm from this point or even if we're to reach a point of, of selling it mm -hmm. um, that you know ultimately that's an exit on, on a property you know to roll it into the next one yeah you know so we're, we're always searching and so yeah you want to yeah kind of start with that i figure we'd start with kind of like um it sounds simple but like why we bought bought the farm like we you and i it's the first farm that we own together 50 50 mm -hmm. um and for anyone listening we bought it under our llc's so i have an llc for my properties you have an llc for your properties and so those llc's uh effectively have an operating agreement that own this 50 50 we're on the deed together right. so so forth so you know essentially we split the bill when we bought the farm mm -hmm. um and this farm was actually off, it was on market. Which, for the record, the bill was about twice what we <laughs> expected it to be. And the, and the farm along with it, you know, and, it was kind of- classic uh, our taste, yeah. Well, you know, you're looking for, um, you know, a, a good deal. I think no matter what, you know I mean? It's like, we're looking for the, the right property at the right time, you know, for the right price. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we had hoped that it would be an acreage size of a certain amount and, you know, which would dictate a price range of a certain amount. And I it just, we, so, we just, went in at like what? 500,000, I think was what we were thinking. Ballpark. Probably. And yeah. looking for like an 80. 80 ish. Yeah. yeah. And we did, we looked at several eighties, um, on that side. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. you know, and we, we, it wasn't that they were bad farm. We just didn't find anything like it, it really comes down to like, when you walk on a farm, it should, it should jump out at you of like, Oh, this is this is what I'm looking for. Yeah. Well, we weren't just going to buy a farm to buy a farm. I mean, we wanted to buy a farm w with a purpose mm -hmm. of you know killing big deer or having the opportunity to grow an older age class of bucks. Mm -hmm. You know, ideally in an area where uh, genetically they had you know yep. the the, uh, the the chance anyways to to, to chase giants. Mm -hmm. Um, and we did. Yeah. And so it just so happened that that opportunity when it presented itself to us with uh, the right property for you know, what we thought was a fair price for that property. Mm -hmm. It just happened to be a lot more than we were looking for, you know, originally. So yeah. we, we ponied up, right. And, and pulled, you know, pulled all of our coins together and, and yeah. made it happen. And I mean, so it was, this property had been on market listed, um, through an insurance agent. Through, yeah. Through <laughs> an insurance agent. And I want to say they had it listed for a million dollars. Does that sound right? I think so. Yeah. Or, or just over a million, maybe like yeah. a million fifty. Um, and so it had come off market. And you, you talk about like wanting the right price. You know, I think the more, the more that I do this for sure. And the more that we talk to other people, whether it's Skip Sly or Lee Lukoski or, or Nick Skalma or whoever it is, 
the the thought process, and it's harder today than it's ever been, um, is instant equity. That if you can purchase a farm and achieve instant equity, and what I mean by that is buy a farm for a price that is less than the market value of that farm. That there's no better way to start off a journey on a property um, than that. Uh, the only other option I would say is probably equally as strong as if you got a land contract at like zero percent interest. Right. Um, so like those Which are the transparently things. is you know if you're going to look at a uh, a big negative, uh, if the objective is to you know profit from the farm is that we're we're paying a high interest rate. interest rate, especially in today's society. I mean we're it is the twenty eighth, which we have tomorrow's sleep day year. Yeah, sleep twenty ninth. Yeah, so twenty yeah. ninth. Um, in today's society, I mean, most land loans on a 20 year land loan are, are north of 7%. Um, you know, rewind into uh, 2021 and you're in the fives or high fours even in some cases. Mm -hmm. um, so to that point, we, we are paying a, a larger interest rate than we want. Um, and I think we've talked about this in the past. You know, I know a lot of people hate that. Uh, and of which I'm not saying that we like it. We, we don't like it either, but we love it. Yeah. <laughs> the The reality is, is that that is a short term situation likely, meaning at some point, whether it's in the next 12 months or 24 months, rates will change. Um, and we negotiated uh, what's called a rate lock in our deal of which we basically have to pay, I think it's $500 and we will get the new rate locked to whatever that interest rate would be. So if, if rates drop into the 5% range, Jared and I essentially could pay our bank a $500 fee. They'll redo the paperwork and we'll lock in at 5%. Simple as that. Like we don't have to do a reclosing, which I have had to, I have had to do in the past. Um, so that's something to keep in mind if you're buying in this market that's high interest rate, that you can negotiate a rate lock um, option in that loan that will allow you to refinance. Cause that's the key. That's why I say it's short term is we may deal with a 7% interest rate here for a couple of years, but if we can refinance to a five or a four or five, we're immediately saving a lot of money per month. Yeah. Well, those closing costs are something for people to keep in mind too. Like it, it's one thing to say like a lot of people right now or have been for the past year, they're like, you know, mm -hmm. it's fine if you can get a good deal at a high interest rate, you know, take yep. it whether it's a house or a piece of property or whatever, and then plan to refinance. You know, mm -hmm. the thing they don't tell you when you're doing that is like, hey, there's there could be some significant costs associated with refinancing. There usually is, yeah. Um, almost to the point of like, depending on the timing of it. Uh, is it worth is it? Is it worth it? Mm -hmm. You know? So. Yeah, that's why that rate lock is so critical versus like um, if you have to switch banks. So the, the advantage of a rate lock is that uh, banks don't lose you. They don't lose their business, basically. The, the other option, and I've done this, um, is to refinance with a different bank at a lower rate, which in that case, I have to go through the closing process all over again. And usually I'll have to bring money to the table to do that closing and refinance. So if, if, if at all costs, you can negotiate that with your current bank, they don't lose your business and, and your loan in their portfolio, you get a better rate and it's a small fee versus bank B is going to give you a better rate, but you got to go through a whole closing process, which is going to cost you money and may outweigh the benefits, um, at least in the short term. Yeah. And I mean, if you have multiple properties rolled in with like a, a portfolio lender, let's say, mm -hmm. you know, it could be to your disadvantage to take properties out of that because that's reducing the equity that exactly. you have. Exactly. That's your leverage. We talked about that. So I mentioned earlier, I talked at um, West Virginia University on Monday to the Energy and Land Management Group. And it was cool because we you know, we talked a lot about um, value of recreational land and it, it's hard for, you know, even a group of West Virginia students to understand like what an Illinois or an Iowa or a Kansas is like what that recreational value is truly contributing to the property. You know, where in our area, it's a lot of oil, gas, minerals, right? That or timber is the value. Recreation has a small factor in it, but not nearly as much as you do when you get out to the Midwest. Mm -hmm. um, and so well, when, the, well, the contrast, I think, is what is the primary market driver? Right. So like in a lot of those Midwestern areas, like uh, recreation is the primary market driver. Unless it's, like, it's tillable. You know, yeah. Yeah. For certainly tillable would be the other one. But mm -hmm. um but yeah, other than that, it's recreation. Yeah. And out here, it's like, you know, there is recreational value on properties, but it's it's almost never uh, exceeding, you know, the value from other things. Yeah, oil, like and gas, oil and gas, timber, timber you know, development. Yep. So we, uh, what I thought was interesting is when we got into the conversation of portfolios and multiple farms, um, it, it was kind of a foreign concept for these guys. And most of them are, you know, 
younger than Nick, frankly. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was a foreign concept in being able to leverage that equity in those portfolios when you buy a new farm versus having to put 20% down every time, mm -hmm. right? You still may have to bring money to the table, but it might be substantially less because you leveraged equity that was already in the portfolio. Yeah. Which, um, you know, again, the underlying fact there is you have to have cash to start. Absolutely. Right. You have to make the initial investment into an asset that you hope will appreciate that you can continue to roll forward. Yeah. And so, I mean, we'll, you know, Obviously, the whole point of us is being transparent. So we we bought that farm. We went under contract in July. We went back and forth a little bit, and we'll talk about some of the nuances. But we ended up buying that farm for nine eighty. Is that what we went under for? Nine twenty five. Was it? Yeah. Okay, nine twenty five. Yep. We he countered at nine. We we stayed at one nine twenty five. We I think our first offer was for like eight seventy five. It was. Yep. Our second offer was for nine hundred. Yep. Our third was for nine twenty five. Uh, Carl, who was the previous landowner, we'll talk about him in a second. He's a tough cookie. Oh, yeah. Uh, in fact, when we made that first offer, he said, yeah, I'm not selling. <laughs> yep. And we were like, well, uh, and even the, even, wait, the, even the agent, when we went to see it, so I mean, we drove out there nine and a half hours, you know, and he's like, I think we were, it was that day. It was that yeah. morning. We had like, uh, we were well into the, the drive. He's like, Hey, just so you know, like we, I talked to the agent this morning and stuff and he's like, he's. He's trying. He, he's not looking to sell. You know, well, he's not. Uh, we lucked out. Come there, he's like, come look at it. Still, he'll. He's yeah. willing to have you on the property, but like, he's not. He's yeah. not interested in selling. Yeah, and and you know, because he's the guy in the area. I mean, Don Wagner was our agent, and Don's awesome. Great guy. The land guys. We've probably yeah, heard of. Yeah, we call him like the gatekeeper of that area. Mm -hmm. Don knows everything. Is super guy. Um, that insurance agent actually ended up getting displaced, and a, a broker that Don knew took that listing over the day before we signed. Um, and so I, it was really that seller's agent that I think told Carl, the previous owner, like, hey, just so you know, like this is a really solid deal in this market that that you're being offered here. Um, and then, you know, called Don and said, hey, you know, Carl said he'll sell it for certain conditions. Um, of which some of the conditions were basically, Carl had lived there pretty much his entire life. Um, he didn't want to leave his farm. That's that's basically what it came down to. Yeah. Is he well, he Carl, did not want to leave. You know, when was uh Carl would have been born what in the for, 40s? 40s. Yeah. You know, and his family's been there since the 30s? Since the 30s. Yeah, yep. so the farm has not changed hands other than from Carl's dad to him. And Carl has not since the 30s left the farm. He has lived on that farm his entire life. Yeah, like he leaves for breakfast, but that's about it. And, <laughs> and for beers and taco night down there. Beers and taco night. Oh, yeah, he's, yeah, he's yeah. well acquainted with the community. For sure. <laughs> but yeah, he, he's not. So I think um, you and I came at it as like, well, what can we, how can we make him feel comfortable in this transaction? And ultimately, we basically gave him two years to live in the house. Mm -hmm. um, for free. Like uh, basically he has to keep up the property. He has to provide insurance, but there's no rent. Right. Um, which, you know, people look at that as a d disadvantage in that, well, we can't use the house. Like when we go out there and stay, but I also look at it as an advantage of, you know, the 350 days that we're not there. Somebody's living actively in it, like yeah. having the heat run, having the water run, which for us is honestly a, a much bigger advantage. Like I'll yes. happily find a nearby Airbnb or we ended up staying with friends and stuff that yeah. we made in the area. Um, it's, it's really valuable to have somebody living in the house, like yes. just making sure it's, it's, there's, yep. you know, think about all the things that could happen in a house that's unattended. I mean, they, they age pretty quickly, they do. you know, whether it's pipes breaking or the HVAC turning off or yeah, roof leak, whatever. Yeah. So you want to have somebody there. So that's, that's worked out really well. Mm -hmm. So it was a, it was a compromise on our side. And frankly, I think that's what got the deal done with Carl and that oh, we basically is. said, you don't have to leave. Um, you've got two years and Carl's in his late eighties at this point. Um, you know, and so he, I know he's told us that he's looking for another place, but we also haven't really put the screws to him to be like, Hey, you got to get out. Sure. Well, cause you yeah, know, frankly, we're kind of benefiting from him being there in the yep. meantime. Yep. So, so we bought that for nine twenty five. which going back to your point, uh, you know, that's $180,000 in cash that we had to come up with mm -hmm. between the two of us. That's a lot of money. <sighs> Boy, try not to think about that. That's a lot of freaking money. <laughs> Uh, the most money transparently that I've ever had to bring to the table on any of my farms. Um, and it also was a hard thing. It was my first one. Yeah. It was also a hard pill to swallow in that, um, you know, we had basically, if we gave certain values to the structures, uh, which is there's a house and two pool barns. Um, I think we ended up buying that for about 57 or 5,800 an acre, uh, is what it equated out to. Uh, and that's, 
substantial that's double oh. plus mm. of any other farm i've ever bought well so you know we went into that with um you know some knowledge that uh just fr from a a topo stamp you know looking at the map yeah looking at the area that it's in and also you know you know friends and surrounding it you know ben rising on some farms not far mm -hmm. from there and, and he was a part of connecting us with this farm and stuff too so we we knew what kind of uh you know potential was was mm -hmm. there um so we were excited going into the farm i mean not like heart set on it type of a deal but we were yeah well, i mean we've we heard were rumors. anticipating there were plenty of pictures flying around that were like you know world-class bucks which is what we were looking for yeah and not only that i mean there was you know there was trail camera information from the property you know and, yeah. and we were and i don't think it was all of it you know i think it was like uh uh you know the guy that had hunted it previously was uh was leasing it from carl for yep. a nominal fee right mm -hmm. and he provided some imagery some. which i'm sure it was i'm sure it wasn't everything and but even the ones that were there and some of the deer that are on carl's wall I was gonna say the like, ones at carl's house it's like that's what we're looking for it's a 190 inch eight, like mainframe eight point in that house yeah um there's a three-year-old with double drops sheds that were probably 70s probably damn close mid to high 60s at least yeah Giant. so i mean it, the potential and that's what we were looking for are we in an area that has potential to produce big bucks mm -hmm. um and the other thing was is this farm was income producing which i think and originally we and probably just a spinoff of like me having just got into the timber game. I was looking at that aspect, but that timber market is foreign. Like what, yeah. how Illinois does timber market versus how I'm doing it in Ohio, completely foreign. But the fact that it was producing CRP income, substantial, uh, almost $20,000 mm -hmm. in CRP income was like, whoa, wait a minute. Like that's, that's big. That's a huge advantage to this farm. Um, not only because of the cover from a hunting standpoint in an area that is very, very ag dominated, but we've got $20,000 a year coming in and, in well, yeah, in I income. mean, especially to offset, like, you know, we talked about the high interest rates. It's like, that's obviously an expense, you know, mm -hmm. on top of your principal payments. And it's like, if you can offset that in some way, it's, uh, that's huge. You know, think about this farm over 10 years will essentially produce for you $200,000, you know, from CRP. Yeah. Awesome. Pretty sweet. Yeah. For doing nothing for doing nothing and those are you know those are term contracts and i think mm -hmm. they're set to expire in the next you know two or three years three i think we have three and four on them i think it's 2027 and 2028 or something yeah so you know it's a beautiful thing for you know a hunter you know somebody in our situation mm -hmm. is like man that's crp and it's in its in its fullest form which we didn't experience the first year because it got cut got mode but uh it's a huge advantage to the wildlife and it's you know like you said just producing you twenty thousand dollars a year so this coming year you know i'm hopeful that that will that will really yield some serious results as far as the deer that we can serious carry cover yeah and uh on top of that you can take up to 10 percent of each of those fields you know mm -hmm. uh, contracts you mm -hmm. know whatever whichever fields they're in you know 10 percent of them and put into like a wildlife food plot which is awesome which we've kind of started the process on you know so since we bought that farm um we closed in september we had access to it prior to that mm -hmm. um we have put one two three four five food plots five food plots. two of which we cleared we had a, yep. a guy with a skid steer come, come in, in and clear we cl it. cleared two of them those are mm -hmm. both standing clover plots um and even more recently here so th this will apply for this coming year we negotiated with the farmer who this past year had only farmed about six acres yep harvested it you know paid us whatever two thousand bucks yeah two thousand bucks um 1800 turned that into there was an old an old hay field that they'd mm -hmm. been taking hay off of and kind stuff. of centrally located about a four acre field i mean it's yeah it's where you want standing grain so that's that's what we worked out with them this year they're gonna they're gonna plant that to i believe it'll be corn this year mm -hmm. and we'll have four acres of standing corn this year for essentially we gave them that six acres that they had been farming for free yep and there's an additional sixteen eighteen hundred dollar yeah, investment on our end that we'll take out of that crp payment yep and because you got to have it yeah you got to have huge you know, standard grain, that's what's going to keep deer there from year to year. Mm -hmm. And the hunting opportunities that that will create will be, I mean, huge. Well, and good relationships with the farmer to try to work things out and, yeah. and have, a, have a good conversation on that side. Um, you know, you mentioned the food plots we established. Uh, and people probably heard us on the hunt. Like, we, we did a lot of spray seed uh, in thick nastiness. Spray and toss. Uh, and with marginal results <laughs> mm -hmm. some better than others uh our rye did really well in fact like we can see deer here in february coming out to some of those rye fields that are popping 
but a lot of like our brassica plots and stuff were were not well great. yeah i mean we had to make do with limited time but also i mean i'm seeing uh, we're seeing results from those just because sure. not, none of the neighboring food plots that we are uh uh, farms that we know of have correct food plots on them so anything once those crops come off um it, you know even the littlest things i see some of those alfalfa and clover fields that we've got planted yeah. have piles of deer in them Pile of them. so they are looking for food that time of year yep. you know and if a guy were to and and you know our plan for this year probably will be to beef those up and really yep solidify the food that we're offering on that farm i mean yeah it's you'll it, it'll hold them yeah so the the big things that we looked at and as we kind of got into the season, um, the first time we ever hunted it was 20, it was right before Halloween. Uh, mm -hmm. We had gone out. We had put cameras up uh, when we came out and seeded. Um, it's fine. I found 20 bucks in my pocket. How about that? Uh, how about that? <laughs> That's not an everyday okay? yeah, I like that. And buying another farm. <laughs> um, so we... We had gone out, we had set cameras up when we seeded and stuff, and we hadn't been back out. Um, and so right before Halloween, we decided to do, I think, like a three-day stretch hunt that we were going to do. Mm -hmm. And um, we, up until that point, um, it was kind of funny. It, so break down the, the landscape level. There are thousands and thousands of acres of ag fields around us. I mean, thousands. And basically, the only cover is the corridors on the creeks, which is where our farm is. Yep. Um, last year, it was all in standing corn, all the ag around us, basically, mm -hmm. minus a few small soybean plots. Well, you know, small relative to the to, area. To They're the like 80-acre bean fields. Yeah, you know, but, but relative to how much corn was up. Compared to thousands of acres Correct. of corn. Yeah. And so I would say most of September, we had one or two mature bucks probably mm -hmm. on camera. Yep. Um, floppy was one of the first that showed up yep. and then I can't even remember what other one it was. We, we had another mature buck probably show up. It wasn't until we got into about that first to second week of October that all of a sudden new bucks started to pop up. Um, and keep in mind that, uh, up until we got out there, even for Halloween, most of the corn was still standing. They had not taken it off. Mm -hmm. um, and so why I say that is that established thousands of acres of cover essentially around us, which was a kind of a disadvantage to our farm because in the event of like, we'll have this year where it's all beans, we're limited. We're the limited cover in that scenario. So, you know, some of these bucks probably were laying in the middle of a 250 acre cornfield, you know, and for most of October, they didn't have to move because the corn was still standing. Yep. Um, whereas if that's beans, they're going to have to find that more permanent cover, which is where our farm is going to really succeed at. So that was, uh, and we didn't know, right? We, we didn't really know what to expect, but we started to see more bucks show up in October as some of that corn started to come down. And I want to say it was right before we went out there that we had seven or eight mature bucks on camera. Oh, yeah. I mean, it started piling in starting like mid-October. Yep. And so, like, immediately it's like, okay, n you know, what do we do? Um, and we had, we had a four-year-old that was probably in the mid-60s. We had a three-year-old that was probably 50s. But then we had a bunch of five-year-olds that were 120 to 140 um, mm -hmm. or older in terms of uh, five older. Yeah, well, I'm trying to remember, too. I mean, there were several, we had several four-year-olds show up that were like, uh, one was in the, you know, high, I'm going to say high 50s, pushing 60 yep. range. Uh, there's two of them, actually. Yep. Um, and there was a third, uh, what do we call him, Mick Jagger? Yeah, Mick Jagger. You know, mid, mid to high 40s type, yep. you know. So solid bucks, you know, bucks yep. that were like, hey, you know, maybe we want to give him another year or two. We're still figuring out the Yeah, we don't know what's going to show up. There are bucks, you know, Floppy being an example, that we can see clearly are like, six seven eight years old or older we we, yep. have, we don't know with no history but like the age class is there so i mean our objective kind of you know at that point became uh taking out some of those older age class lower scoring bucks mm -hmm. which we're happy to shoot yeah it's we not felt like, great about not that. like we get those uh, that opportunity every day um to make room for you know some of those up and coming three and four year olds yeah and so that was i think when we set out before halloween we had probably four um, maybe five bucks on our list that were like, if these deer come yeah. by, we're going to kill them. Yeah. Um, of which I did first, first day that we were out there, one of those bucks showed up and I killed him. Yep. Um, which was well, Halloween day. Right. So we'd hunted what two, two days uh, prior it was to the that? day before Halloween, I think that I had killed mine or uh -huh. maybe even uh -huh. the 29th. It's Halloween day. Was it? Uh -huh. For sure. No. Cause we did the podcast. I've been around before, day. but I think it was the day before. Out. I think it was 30th. 
Because I thought we did the podcast, the live from Illinois on Halloween night. Nick, Nick, we did do Halloween night pod. So I think I killed him the day before. Okay, you could be right. I think so. But we hunted. You hunted the thirty first, and you hunted the first after I was effectively tagged out. Which, while Jared's looking at, explain a couple of things. One of the other reasons we bought in Illinois is that you're right. You're right. As October a landowner, 30th. as a non-resident landowner. Jared and I can each shoot a buck with the normal non-resident archery tag, and then we can shoot another buck with either a firearm tag or a non-resident landowner archery tag. The downfall of that is this past year when we bought the farm, we missed that, op- that timeline opportunity. You're right. It was the 30th. 30th. So we missed that timeline opportunity. So we had one non-resident archery tag each, and then essentially we could buy a firearm tag after that if we wanted to kill a second buck. Um, in a, in future years, we will actually have two non-resident archery tags that we can use one that's a landowner tag and one that's the normal state tag. Mm -hmm. Um, so just for people listening of like, well, what, what are the other advantages of why you bought in Illinois is we can kill two bucks with a bow potentially. Yep. Um, over the counter. Yep. Over the counter. And since both you and I, and I think you can only use that gun tag during the gun season. Correct. Only during the gun season. It's pretty limiting, but that's the advantage of that landowner tag is you can use Uh, bow or gun yeah Mm -hmm. throughout the entire season you Mm -hmm. can shoot two bucks yeah as long as it's no more than two and because you and i both have businesses that are on there 50 50 we both have the ability to get that tag um so there are some some nuances to that if you want to look into it of you know how many people can be on the property how many you know stakeholders essentially to get tags but for this purpose it's just jared and i so we're we're both uh valid for it so, yeah, so I tagged out basically with Bo uh, at that point. I didn't have a tag. So you hunted the next couple of days, slow, it got hot. I was just hot. looking at the thing there. It looks like maybe the next day and yeah. then we kind of went home. Got hot. And then, but you had already planned on coming back. Well, we hadn't seen a whole lot of like rutting activity. Not. I didn't anyways. You know, Mine was more pre-rut. I mean, I rattled and, and snort wheezed that buck in, but yeah. like. I mean, well, even that, you know, I just, we just weren't, mm-hmm. we just weren't having the sightings there out of the gate for, for whatever reason. We just hit it a little bit early, but. Yeah, so we decided to, to pull out. We're like, hey, we'll back out. And I do think you saw one of our shooters like right at first light when you were getting into the same spot did. that I shot I mine out of. I saw that. Uh, that G4 buck? G4. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, it was the next day. So I, you killed that night, the night of the 30th. I went and hunted that. The next morning. The next morning. Yep. And had him come through like at first Right light. at it. Boy, it was kind of, it was, it was kind of a shit show. <laughs> yeah, I remember getting in there, you know. It was gray light by the time you were in. Yeah. <laughs> And I truthfully, I don't know, like, had I been in there 10 minutes earlier, if, if I could have shot him, because it was, it was still really dark. It was a tough access, too. I mean, I went in the, the evening before and did a hanging hunt with the lone wolf. Dude, you could kill, you, and I'm telling you, whether it's us or somebody in the future, you can kill a buck out of that stand every single year. We call it the pinch of pinches. The pinch of pinch. You know, and you, <laughs> you hung the, the lone wolf custom gear, I think, Yeah. Uh, the, you know, the night that you hung, and it was... You know, you were yeah. hanging and hunting, so it's like I you, was scrambling a bit. You're scrambling it was a bit, late and, and yeah, and uh, you know, not a lot of time. I for, bumped a buck actually right on the creek bed on the other side of me, yeah. and so then I was like, "Shit, I got to get up in a tree." Yeah, so not a lot of time for you know trimming uh, limbs and stuff like that. So you I, went higher, didn't you? I hunted. Yeah, well, I hunted your stand. Yeah, you left it in there that following morning, but eventually I did go back. So, um, kind of as the story goes here, we we backed out, and I ended up going back. Uh, about a week later mm-hmm. right before kansas on the way to kansas because we were catching the weather mm-hmm. front i was like gotta be there yep. right so went out and part of that first day that i got there i didn't actually hunt the first yep, afternoon I that, that. that i could have um i hung one set uh on a, a standing grain field that we had there for a deer yep. we call um crazy Flop. horse oh crazy horse yeah crazy horse. he had just shown up that was an ancient deer is an ancient deer still alive yep still alive and i also went over um and hung a new muddy at the pinch of pinch at the pinch of pinch and so that yep. i've got a you know in fact now we've got muddies in one two three four yeah four i've got four permanent stands hung that i mean i feel confidently are in you know, yeah, really good spots. Yeah, uh, in fact, one of them I I killed, I killed out of that yep. that, that that trip. Yeah, so I hung that afternoon. Um, the following morning, I hunted uh, the pinch pinch. Yep, I want to say, and uh, I can't, I can't recall. I think it was a pretty pretty slow hunt. I remember, mm-hmm. Mick called me. We're talking bows and stuff yep. like that. And then that afternoon, um, well, this is cool tie in, I guess, with the farmer. I was I was driving in. I was going to hunt a spot that we call. <sighs> What do we call that interior plot there? Honey hole. The honey hole. Mm-hmm. 
and uh, you ran into the farmers. Ran into the farmer, yeah, and so uh, confirmed. It's funny. One of our farmers is a, a young, r- really pretty girl, and, yeah. and when we, we were call out her there, hot farmer. We call you hot, <laughs> hot farmer lady. And so we, ne- I'd never run into, never met her in person. It was just the first time we were out there. We, it was uh, in July. We passed the tractor. I was like, just pretty like a girl driving that combine there or whatever the you know plant John, giant John Deere, and we're like, what? <laughs> And so, yeah, it was, it was confirmed. So her and her dad, she actually taken over, you know, the farming business from her dad, but they, they farmed that as well as a bunch mm-hmm. of other acres between there and their house. And I uh, had a really great conversation with them. Uh, just kind of got uh, an understanding of like the relationship that they had had with Carl yep. introduced ourselves as the new owners and stuff. And, and also, you know, use that opportunity to express our intention of like, Hey, we, you know, want this to be worth your while uh, to be out here. But you know, if we can work something out, we really would benefit from some standing grain on, on the farm you yeah. know, or uh, just food sources in any capacity. If you're willing to help us out, like yeah. you're here, we're not, you know, let's, let's work together. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I feel like that went really well. So I was excited about that. And it was just, it was one of those afternoons where, you know, high pressure bluebird day. Yeah. You were a little good late vibes, in good interaction. That. Yeah. That put me a little bit late, but you know, I, I ultimately went into the honey hole and killed that night. And it was, uh, cause I had was, crazy horse on the camera, like right up above you, like five minutes after you were in that tree stand. Yeah. Well, dude, it was just, I mean, uh, I, I can't recall if I've ever had like a better, rut hunt like mm, your classic it like it, like what you would hope for you know it's like bucks running everywhere you know just panting falling down the hill over each other does running everywhere that thermals pulling right down into that bottom where you were at yeah well in fact i think they were they were rising right oh so, yeah because of the pressures yeah mm-hmm. yeah so it was uh you know that's that can be a tough spot to hunt just because it's like you're you're in a hub right yep. and they know that and so they'll travel it and the mm-hmm. wind will kind of swirl down there we put clover and rye in a little little quarter acre plus plot down there Mm -hmm. but that night um you know the wind was perfect from a from a uh like a prevailing wind standpoint Mm -hmm. it was it was coming in the direction that i we needed it to for access and stuff but also the thermals were rising and pulling it right up out of that bottom so i was like pretty rock solid and i mean yeah start to finish i had uh you know saw crazy horse that night i had a really nice up and coming two-year-old that's still alive which dude uh, you know a west central and a two-year-old I mean, that deer was probably beefy. all over 130. Yep. Yeah, and I mean, walked right down in front of me 15 yards. He was still holding as of a couple of days ago. Yep. And then ultimately, I ended up killing one of those. I think probably a five-year-old eight point mm-hmm. that was just with, with that group. Crazy Horse was in there, too. They were just, like, harassing the crap out of this bedding area that's right above it. But uh, I thought it was cool. That deer actually, in, in the midst of that chase, you said, came down and drank out of the creek. Yep. And you grunted at him, right? I did. Yeah. And then he came over, worked a scrape, and... Yep dead and then yeah just came in 20 yards and i'm uh, you know textbook like almost two i mean it's not like uh but before that i, I wouldn't have said he's going to come from right here sure. this is what's going to happen yeah, yeah, but, it was like a hillside but as it was happening i'm like yeah this is how it happens you know it, you know and it's it, when we go back to this farm and, and you know we didn't really we we had a good idea when we saw it that what we could do with it and that it's going to produce what i don't know if we realized until probably when you and i both killed in in archery and we'll talk about gun here in a second but um it it's one of the more huntable farms that i think i've ever seen uh oh yeah i mean it's like short of saying it's easy it's like dude we went in how many times do you think we actually hunted the farm you know was it like seven days i literally sat one afternoon and shot a buck the other morning i sat with my dad first set the 30th yeah (laughs) yeah then you're right dude we must have gone out on the 30th and hunted through like maybe the first state for like three days Yeah. yeah we did Okay, so cu- let's say three days. Yeah. You know, one, one, two, three with one mature buck down. Mm-hmm. And then I went back out and I killed on the second set. Second set, so five and you killed And then when we came back for gun, for gun season, we killed day. on the first set. So it's six days and three mature bucks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pretty good. You know, so if you want to give us credit for that, fine. <laughs> you know, but just the moral of the story is like, hey, we, we looked at it. We analyzed it. Yeah. Uh, we made some minor adjustments, but ultimately we've had a, a very high rate of success. And, and in a, it, in a stance where that farm was not nearly at the potential that it should have been. I mean, definitely almost 60 acres of that farm was cut CRP, like mowed CRP. Well, and it's, you know, you know, you'll hear guys like, uh, you know, Eva Hart's famous for saying that like, uh, you know, Midwestern deer are easy to hunt and stuff. And that's not necessarily the case, but mm-hmm. when it comes to breaking down a farm and looking at it, it's like. Dude, there's only so many places they can be. That's it. That's so, the big one. So for me. if you can have a strategic access and hunt it on you know the right weather conditions, so you're not tipping them off with being in there all the time, like you're gonna kill them. I, you know if they're yeah. there, and 
you know, they're there. Yeah. So. And that's that. I think that's it is like, there's only so many places these deer are going to bed. They're using, I mean, we, and it was by chance, you know, we put whatever seven or eight cameras out and like we could pattern those deer from camera to camera. Like we, we knew the well, loops that they were basically making. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, dude, in hindsight, like not to pat ourselves on the back too much, like we, we figured it out very quickly. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, it's just one of those farms, I think, or, you know, we applied knowledge from farms that we hunt out here. It's just like, man, it's fairly textbook. Uh, there is one spot on his farm that like, and we knew the second that we walked to it, I was like, that's every, every deer that comes through this part of the county is going to yep. hit that scrape. Yep. And, and sure they enough, did. they do. It's right on the <laughs> county of that corning of that, uh, standing grain field that we just negotiated. Yeah. You, you could run one camera, well, you know, I'd say between there and a pinch of pinch, like you could run two cameras and, and, get you, every and you would get inventory of every single buck that's on that farm throughout the year. Yeah. Absolutely. Which is extremely valuable for like an out of stater. It's like, man, you, we can't really afford to be moving cameras around all the time and like from different places. It's also it's it's a non mineral, non bait state. So right. there's there's nothing influencing that movement. Your you know scrapes are your best scrapes, bet, yeah, um, and pinch points and stuff like that. So that's it. It's fun from that aspect. It's like you can very quickly inventory the deer that are using mm -hmm. that farm. We ended up having I think it was fourteen or fifteen bucks over three years old. And I think it was eight that were probably five and older. Yeah. Um, you know, the the amount of, you know, mature type bully bucks on there were was pretty insane. Yeah. Um and that was in a, you know, in a corn situation as well. And so we went to Kansas and we decided it was hot in Kansas. We weren't having a, a lot of success. So we decided to take the dads to Illinois um Friday night. Or no, Thursday night, because Friday was the opening day of gun season mm -hmm. in Illinois. And it was on the way home. It was on the way home. Yeah. And so um, we we go back, we go there. And I mean, uh, probably one of the most perfect weather days. We hit a front, uh, you know, coincidentally. And um, freaking bucks running everywhere. Running everywhere. Yeah. You know, we saw basically every buck that we were looking for, we saw. And you ended up shooting floppy, which had been one of our, tar like, number, probably the number one target buck we had. Yep. Um, down at Pinch of Pinches. Yep. And so it quickly was like, yeah, so it was opening morning, basically. And it's like, okay, we pull out now. Um, my, it, first, my first buck with a gun. First buck with a gun, <laughs> and, which is uh, crazy. shot one of his tines off, we're pretty sure, yeah. which was kind of, I don't know him, how that happened. Knocked but. him silly on the first <laughs> shot, killed him on the second. Um. And Carl came down and recovered the buck, which is kind of cool yep. with you. But it, again, it was like the amount of potential that this farm had, um, you know, it was just kind of mind blowing. And I think a lot of those deer were really running around because they had literally just pulled the corn off. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of those deer were kind of displaced of like, well. you know, where are they bedding, where they are. Floppy wasn't and um, Crazy Horse wasn't. But some of these other bucks. That high 50s, four-year-old. Well, I mean, dude, it was just... It's the rut. You yep. know what I mean? It's like, uh, you know, a lot of guys, think, you know, even still, they think the rut is like that first two weeks in November. It's like in the Midwest, I said, it certainly is correlated with weather events. Yeah. Uh, you know, as far as what you're going to see from day, uh, daylight activity. And I remember this past year, I was, we were following a lot of like on Instagram or TikTok. Mm -hmm. Higgins was giving his daily updates, which yeah. I appreciate because Higgins, yeah. you know, he's not far from a city sure. in Illinois. And so it was interesting to kind of compare. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, dude, they peaked on... I mean, for us, and you see a lot of other guys, the ninth yep. this past year yep. um, was the first real rutting activity that, that we saw. Coincided with a big front. Definitely. That's mm -hmm. what it was. Yeah, mm -hmm. I got them up. And uh, so I killed on the ninth mm -hmm. in the honey hole with the bow. And then I, I don't know what the weather was necessarily while we were in Kansas, but I assume similar, warm. And yeah, warm. Kind of cool. warmed up a yep. bit and slowed down. And then again, front. that opening day of gun season, oh, it was just like, you know. It's like 20 degrees. High pressure. Exactly what you want. And, you know, they were running everywhere. Not yep. because of gun season or pressure or anything like that. They were, they they were, were full chasing. on rutting. In fact, I snort wheezed uh, yeah. floppy in. Yep. That's, that's what brought them in. Yep. So, you know, what we kind of were able to narrow down is like we started to dissect this farm pretty quickly into it. We have one really big section of bedding, which also coincidentally has some really good black walnut in it. Um, that's right at the pinch of pinch. Of timber. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And then... Um, We've got <clears throat> basically corridors of timber throughout the rest of the property, which is why it hunts so well. Is these deer are just hugging the corridors? Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, truthfully, I and it's important, I think, to to specify that it's timber because it's like, dude, there's a lot of bedding on this on this farm. A lot. Um, 
you know, the CRP didn't get used as much this past year because it had been cut and it was mm -hmm. pretty short. But all of the edges, I mean, this farm just has not been gone on like in sure. forever. Yep. You know what I mean? It's like Carl hunted like in his, his early years, yeah. know, but that's long gone. Yeah. There's a guy that had been leasing it, you know, from uh, Minnesota or wherever he's from, Wisconsin, Wisconsin. Yep. that, you know, same deal was out there. You know, maybe, maybe a few times, you know, mm -hmm. a couple weekends or a week at most per, you know, during the peak hunting season. And now us, it's like in total, we've been on the farm, like, I don't know, 10 days, 10 days, yeah. you know? So it just, it, it doesn't get gone on. There is no pressure there. And a lot of the, um, because it's not been actively farmed, you know, the CRP stuff, all the, everything that's surrounding is just like, is overgrown. Yep. And so there is, a, there's a lot of bedding on this farm. Mm -hmm. uh, and there, Good access too. We have access um, on the entire Western side, which allows us to get to our Southern border and our Northern border for access. Yep. And then we also have access through a deeded right of way on the Eastern side yep. um, that allows us, that's how we access the pinch of pinches. And so, yeah, I mean, from an access standpoint, we have that. We've got cover. Our food was lacking transparently this year just because of the way that we established it in the first year. But, like, that's an e that's probably the easiest thing to fi fix because the soils are so high quality out there. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it, you know, that was kind of our season. Uh, and, frankly, we haven't been back since then. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we know this year, obviously, all of that corn is now going to be beans which is going to change the dynamic of that farm because there won't be that much cover um, out there. Like summer is one thing, but as we especially get into that fall, you know, they're, they can't lay in giant cornfields. They don't exist. It's just beans. Mm -hmm. And so I would assume our farm ends up holding a lot more deer uh, during the early season this year, as opposed to last year when we didn't see them really filter in until mid October. Yeah. Um, it's kind of an unknown for us too, because we don't traditionally hunt, you know, that, uh, significant of ag country. I mean, there's, there's ag around like my Ohio farm and stuff yeah. like that, but it, this is insane. And it does influence, you know, mainly how we can access farms and stuff like that, but it's, it's hard to see a significant difference from year to year as far as where deer sure. are. Um, so this will be a first for us in terms of, you know, and we obviously have a lot of contacts in, in the Midwest and these types of areas that are like, I mean, it's, it can be night and day. Yeah. Um, you know, just based on the crop rotation. So we don't know what this year will hold. I mean, I, I based on what we can look back on, you know, historical data and, and just talking to people, it does seem like on bean years, this farm will have a lot more deer on it and bigger deer. Um, and it can't hurt that we're going to have the CRP standing this year as well, as well as food the standing plants. food, as well as the negotiated grain that we're going to have standing past yep. anything else. So it's kind of, yeah, it's, it's teeing up for like a really, a really, really good year for this farm. Yeah. So I think that's where the curveball comes in <laughs> because <clears throat> we bought this farm for two reasons. One was for exactly what we did last year. Awesome hunting experience, uh, great success. Farm is, farm is amazing. But from an investment side, we also bought it because we got it off market. Um, we knew that it was in a, a, probably one of the highest quality soil areas in the United States. Um, I mean, our CRP payments are over $300 an acre. Yeah. Um, and so with those in mind, we knew that from an appreciation side, this property was probably going to pick up pretty quickly. And it's 144 acres. There's not that many big, like actual huntable tracks. There's big tillable tracks, but big huntable tracks in that area anymore. And so um, we talked to our real estate agent the other day and he's like, yeah, he's like, that thing's probably worth 7,500 an acre now. And it's like, well, now what do we do? Like, mm -hmm. do we, do we keep holding on to it? Um, well, there's pressure on both sides. And so like, it's a fluid situation. Like we, as much as I love the farms that we, that we own and hunt and we are invested in them, it's like, I want to be open-minded to new opportunities. Opportunities. Yeah. And so essentially with that, Kansas came across our board and yeah. Part of that was through our buddy Skip, because Skip always keeps us in tune with things. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we've been hunting Kansas. I, I started hunting Kansas in 2013. And transparently, in the last couple of years, we've struggled a little bit just from access changes and pressure changes. Well, yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, and, and it's worth kind of getting into it a little bit. I think that the reasons that we've struggled, 
there's quite a few of them, honestly. But number one is like it's we're not guaranteed to draw every harder year. harder to draw. As, it used to be almost it was still application, but it was basically a guarantee for bow season. Yeah, so we're non landowners. Yep. Um, you know, so to, to guarantee a tag, you would have to own land mm-hmm. uh, eighty acres or 80 more. Eighty acres gives you one tag in Kansas. So you know, mm-hmm. land ownership would give you an advantage there. Um, also, just I mean, just like any uh, <clears throat> any other state, there's been an in- influx of of pressure and stuff, and yep. so a big part of our strategy out there has been public land, and so as more and more private land has been uh, you know leased out through mm-hmm. services or, or whatever, it's displacing, in our opinion, residents, residents. onto public land, yep. and so that's become a less viable option. It's yeah. just not as good, yep. um, especially in the southeastern part of Kansas. I know that gets a ton of pressure. Close to Missouri. Close to Wichita. Wichita. Close to Wichita. Yeah, yeah, it's just kind of a destination. There's a lot of public land there, yep. so it, it draws people in. Um, uh, weather has been a factor for us. You know, yeah. it's just we can't uh, be as fluid because it's 15 it's hours. It's really away. far away. Yeah, it's really far away. Uh, 16 to that you mm-hmm. know part of the state we had been hunting, and so we, we have to book some things. Whether it's our you know coordination with our dads and plus like Airbnbs and stuff like that. Like you have to book it out in advance. Yeah. And uh, I guess for, you know, final measure is like uh, just because of our stance in Ohio, granted, I don't think it has as big of an effect, but, you know, uh, Kansas is a bait state. Yep. So especially in areas where you have smaller parcel sizes and stuff, I, it does have some influence. Yeah. And the locals will tell you that, too. I mean, it's not what it used to be. People are killing, you know, it's hard. You come from a shittier state. It's hard not to kill a 150 inch three year old that yeah. walks by. Um, and frankly, that was one of the reasons we liked Illinois is that it's not only not a mineral state, it's not a bait state, it's nothing. Like yeah. there, there is nothing on the ground there. So the advantage though in a Kansas is that most of the ground down there is still around that three to 4,000 an acre mark. Um, yeah, well you can get it for even less than that depending on how, how much you're buying. Yep. And so, whereas, you know, obviously and we where just talked buying. about where we're buying, you know, we had bought for 5,700 off market, you know, market value is sitting at like 75, uh, seven to 75. So, you know, it's, there's trade-offs, right? The, the, you know, we're not going to see nearly as much ag as we are going to be down there. It's more cattle ground and, and, and grazing and stuff like that. You know, there's not Which from a hunting standpoint is kind yeah. of whatever, but from an income standpoint, that's where we take the hit. Yep, exactly. And so, you know, the, the reality is, is we, could potentially sell our farm in Illinois and buy double the land in Kansas. And, you know, from my hunting side, I think it's as good. We only get one tag, right? So there's a little bit of a downfall there. But from a potential of killing, you know, giant mature bucks, Kansas is one of the other holy grails. Just as good, if not better. Yep. And um, from an investment side, we lose that annual income that we have on a CRP standpoint, or it's going to be minimized. Um, But... We're getting into a state that still has very affordable land prices that are undoubtedly going to appreciate over the next several years. Yep. Um, it's just that's where we're at at this point. Well, if you just look at like, uh, you know, uh, his- historical trends, you know, it's mm-hmm. like wh- where else can you, you know, buy land that affords you a premium hunting experience, you know, of whitetails? Uh, for, you know, for 3,000 an acre. Just that they're just, uh, exist much. there aren't very many of them. You know, yep. at one time, you know, you could do that in Ohio. You could do it in, mm-hmm. you, you know, some parts of Illinois, you know, even Missouri, but all that mm-hmm. stuff now is, you know, Missouri's 4,500 an acre on a Western border there. Yep. Um, Iowa's just basically off the radar because, can't do it. you know, it takes you six years to draw there now. Yep. Um, so it's like we're, we're moving f- further and further west as far as like uh, seeing or realizing those land values appreciating, mm-hmm. you know, to, to that level. So, so yeah, I mean, that's kind of our thought process there. It's like, man, we're uh, truthfully, you know, the, the hardest part is like, we're, we just talked about how well this Illinois farm is setting up this yeah. year. And it's like, boy, I, and it's six or seven are we about hours to, closer. Are we considering selling a farm this, you know, could easily have a, you know, several one eighties or even a, a 200 on it this year. I, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, to, to go for something that we, we know long-term, I think we'll have, uh, it, it's more of a sure thing from an, from an appreciation standpoint. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but we, we don't know what deer are on it. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's, you, you can't really know that. I mean, you can only do so much research until you, you pull the trigger on something, but, uh, well, and I think the, you know, we talk about the accessibility. I mean, the reality is, is if we buy 320 acres in Kansas, that will award us four non-resident tags, yep. uh, of which then essentially you and I and our dads could hunt every year, Yep. you know, that we want, which is, ex- so that's taken care of. Yeah. And so, you know, it, there, there definitely are disadvantages distance out way there, further, you know, maybe, way further. maybe less annual income coming through, through it. Yeah. Um, 
maybe call it a wash on the deer hunting side, like potential for big bucks, both places is awesome. Illinois maybe gets a little bit more because we could have two bow tags. Mm -hmm. Um, but from an investment side, which is frankly kind of why we talk about, I bought a farm all the time is, you know, how, how much more, uh, will our Illinois farm appreciate? Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to appreciate when we're bringing in $20,000 a year in CRP income. Whereas to your point, the Kansas property will appreciate. That's that's essentially a sure thing, uh, at least over the next five years. You know, and can you take a three thousand dollar investment and turn it into forty five hundred an acre? Well, over three hundred acres, fifteen hundred an acre profit is substantial. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I think we're just looking for room to grow. You know, we're looking at that Illinois piece in the face of opportunity in Kansas and saying, like, man, you know, it is amazing. And you know, how much more amazing can we make it? You know, mm -hmm. I mean, that people are willing to pay. It's just like, you know, I don't see, you know, they're at like 7,500 an acre now. It's like, man, how much higher can that go for I think for it keeps ground? going. I and mean, people ask that all the time. They're like, where's the cap? There is, there, the cap doesn't exist until people say, I won't pay it anymore. Mm -hmm. And with the way that several, you know, groups of people are in this space from a, from a monetary standpoint and, you know, how passionate people are about hunting and they work hard in the, their other aspects of life to be able to enjoy that. You know, there is a top at some point, but you know, it won't cap out until somebody says, yeah, I'm not going to pay that for that. And it's, it's a limited, it, it continues. It's a limited resource. Nick keeps going. They're not making any more land. So it's like, it's not like you can just sit back. Um, you know, Bill's Bill Winky's the guy that said it. He's like, man, you want prices to stop. You got to jump in the game. That's the only way you're going to stop it is if you buy it. If you don't buy it, prices are going to continue to go up. Uh, I don't see land prices dropping. I see them leveling out maybe with interest rates and stuff, but the way that the demand has been, the way that the amount of inventory has been in all of these states, frankly, like I don't see it in, uh, decreasing or even stabilizing anytime soon. I think it's going to continue to go up. Yeah. Well, no matter how you turn it, I mean, that, that Illinois farm is high, highly attractive. I mean, I think there's a lot of speculation about what interest rate uh, reduction yeah. will do. Um you know, a lot of people will say, you know, hey, interest rates come down, there's going to be like a, a buying frenzy, you know, but at the same time, there's, there's other people that will say, um, you know, hey, there's also going to be a selling frenzy because a lot of people are, you know, basically sitting on yeah, low they, interest mortgage rates right yeah, now. They don't want to sell. So a lot of activity, you know, in, in <laughs> either way, but it's like, so, so what does that do uh, in terms of, uh, is it a buyer's market or is, or is it a seller's market? I think that's kind of to be determined, I mm -hmm. guess, or a little. A, It'll really deter be determined based on how many pull the tr trigger to sell, um, because it, if people, to our point, we talked about this with multiple farms, my high farm. It's like I could sell that farm today, and I probably could get a premium for it because there's not much on the market. Mm -hmm. In that same breath, there's not much on the market. So what am I going to buy right. if I sell? So that that becomes, I think, the hurdle for a lot of people is if even if somebody wants to sell, they're going to be looking likely at something else unless it's a cash out at this point. And there's not, there's not much. That is the, I mean, that is the struggle is finding, finding a good farm. Well, we t that was the big discussion we had offline is like, I've seen farms come up. First of all, they're ridiculously priced. Um, second of all, they're not good in my opinion. Like maybe they have good deer on them, but the layout, the opportunity, what you can actually do with that farm, is it bringing in any money? No, the answer is no across the board. So, you know, you made the, the crack and it's no knock to them, but like a lot of these residential agents that are selling land will say like amazing hunting opportunities, you know? Yeah. And it's like, but yeah, and it's, it, why? It, it, that's, <laughs> we see a lot of that here just because it's, there's so many agents and brokers and so little recreational ground. It, I mean, it's, it's like, it's really overboard, but even in, you know, that part of Illinois, mm -hmm. you know, anywhere, uh, you know, the, you know, uh, land agents essentially is like, it's just, you expect to see it now. It's like every single listing, whether it's like <laughs> Could a, be a, a 10 out of 10 a, or, yeah, or a, or a two out filled. of 10, it's going to say, it's going to say premium hunting experience on it because yeah. they know that the, the market for that That's is like off the charts. That's what they're leaning on. There is no other market there. That's what they're leaning yeah. on. Yeah. And it's, it just almost like nullifies it. It's like, you know, you can look at the same properties that have been sitting on land watch for, you know, six yep. months and it just, yeah, premium hunting and this and that. And it's just like, the reality is I think to find a good piece, like you really need to dig in. You well, I mean, I mean, that's what we looked at. I don't know four farms on that first trip before we came back out for this one, you know, and none of them were 
great, but none of them were bad either. It just wasn't like nothing jumped off the page and they sold. to us. They've all sold. They've all sold. Yep. Um, this one we bought, frankly, the only reason we got it is because we stayed on it and it was off market. Mm -hmm. And and Rising was the guy who connected us with Don. Don connected us with this off market listing. Yep. And so you know, people who were looking to buy, even with the same budget we had, may have not even known about this farm because it wasn't on market at that point. I'm sure Don. they didn't. Well, so, we we were pressed to. I mean, that was a big part of it. We're like, hey, we, we can't let this go to market. Right. Yeah. Because <laughs> we'll, we'll lose to, it. It's we'll going to go to market. Mm -hmm. So you know, those are the things that I think when you look across the board of like you know, the value, the, the downfall of selling even to make a, uh, a return on your investment, which obviously we stand to do here, is that you give up the ability for several things to, to earn money on an annual side with CRP, but we, we've got to 1031 that thing into something else or all the profit that we make on it will basically get washed to taxes basically, at the end of the day, right. which we don't want. So, you know, in order to sell it, we then have to know, buy something. Mm -hmm. And honestly, in that part of Illinois, there isn't anything. I mean, it, at least not right now. I mean, I look all the time and nothing else is coming up. Mm -hmm. um, and if it does come up, it's as much or more than what we would likely sell our farm for. So that's what essentially brought down to, well, okay, what are the other meccas that we would go to? Iowa. Well, we can only hunt there, you know, okay. once every five or By six years. By the way, fly in there tonight. Fly in there tonight. Yeah. Yep. Not to buy land, but yeah. to walk some stuff. Walk some stuff and go to the Deer Classic. Um, or two, Kansas, of which because of the landowner role, we could hunt every year and we could buy a lot of property there because of the price per acre. That becomes very attractive. <laughs> well, it just, it is one of the last, and I know, you know, we've, we just talked about it, our struggles in the southeastern part of the state. I mean, there, there are pockets where it's ruined, you know, it's like, it's not worth a damn. No. Um, but there are pockets that are you know, largely untouched, you know, primarily, you know, you get into these large ranch properties that are thousands of acres. It's, you know, it's just, uh, the nature of, of the land is such that, you know, and, and the parcel size is such that you, you just, you know, even the hunting pressure that is there, it, it just can't, it, it hasn't had, uh, the drastic impact right. on age structure that it has in other parts of the state That's where, it. you know, parcels continue to get split up more and more, you know, pressure gets applied regulation gets loosened you know that's what it technology comes gets on top of that it's yeah. like yeah nationwide we're in uh like an an over uh over accessibility yeah over under accessibility under accessibility of property but over accessibility of resources to kill the deer that are there mm -hmm. so you know we find ourselves looking for situations where deer still have the opportunity to get old even though we're dealing with things you know still like in, like bait and baiting let, neighbors, and let's not go all whatever. the way down this road but like you know as we're talking to Tom McFarland's the, you know, whitetail agent in the territory mm -hmm. that we're looking at. Um, you know, other guys from here. We've t I've openly said, like, you know, hey, here's how I feel about baiting in Ohio, where I have a lot of experience about it. It's, it's a negative for us. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have as strong of an opinion in a, in a place like Kansas. I just, frankly, I don't have as much experience with it and how it affects it. Here's what I do know. Uh, you know, the parcel sizes are much bigger. Yeah. And I do think that, you know, <laughs> a corn pile on every one, three, and five acre track that, that borders a, a you know a, a couple hundred acre property or something will have a drastic impact. Drastic. A corn pile on every thousand acre ranch, you know, or even two or three of them is, in, just logic would tell you, I think it's going to have a much less much of an less. impact. They're still going to come to them. Deer mm -hmm. still going to get shot off mm -hmm. of them, but they are not going to have as drastic an effect on the age structure as as, uh, as no. it does out here. So I'm I'm more open minded to yeah going back into that type of a scenario. And frankly because of the soil types and stuff in that part of Kansas is it's like arid. It's very arid, you know? So it's like, you're going to have low success growing row, row well. crops or, or crops that require like a, a high moisture content, you know? So like, uh, you know, even your clovers and stuff yeah. are going to struggle. You're looking at like alfalfa and, uh, like a cereal rye, mm -hmm. uh, or, or winter wheat rather. Yeah. And, uh, and probably a feeding program on top of that. So, yeah. I mean, that, that likely would be a part of our strategy if we're going to move back out to that pile on top of that it's not illinois river bottoms no. you know so the hunting strategy is very different very different you know it's basically stay uh flat <laughs> well no In ditches yeah ditches like cuts like cuts. cut banks yeah. and stuff like almost borderline badlands feelings in yeah. some areas but it's a lot of uh native grass with mm -hmm. with cedars yeah cedar pockets and stuff and so 
they just move differently out there. And we're mm-hmm. going to have to, you know, that that's kind of the excitement of the, sure. you know, figuring a farm like that out. Yeah. And it's tough, you know, because if we think about like our nature is to be hands on with a lot of the farms that we, we own and we work on and we hunt. And like the reality is, is we won't out there because it's so far. You know, if we got to Illinois four times in a year, we'll get to Kansas twice a year. You know, it's just, it, it's going it, to, the the distance is the biggest disadvantage that, that sets itself out there. I agree. Um, everything else we can work with. So, yeah, it becomes. Um, well, there's two. It's distance and loss of income. Yep. Those are the, those are the two big sure. hurdles. Yeah. And so, you know, when you, when you start to put through, like you're really looking at two obstacles and that you're overcoming, but the two advantages could be, can you find something potentially slightly below market value, which gives you instant equity. And then, you know, that it's going to appreciate significantly in the next four to five years Mm -hmm. as, as pressures happen in Missouri, as pressures happen in Illinois, um, as pressures happen in Oklahoma, who knows what happens with Iowa here? There's a lot of bills flying around up there. Kansas could become the next Mecca that people try to buy, especially because you own 80 acres, you got a tag. Um, these other kind of Mecca states, you don't have that opportunity. So it, it becomes a very big target, I think, long term. And I say long term, four, five, six years, um, that the appreciation of where we buy now to where it is then is going to be a substantial return on investment. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe there's some sacrifices initially for us from these other indirect benefits that we look when we buy a piece of land, um, distance, uh, loss of income. But ultimately, the long-term game or five, five or six-year gain is like, can we take a million dollars and turn it into a million seven? Mm-hmm. That's that's a huge return. Yeah, and as we're working through this process, I mean, it's the, the next, uh, maybe not the next, but like it's we'll do an I bought a farm basically of like running through the numbers. Likely once we're under contract, yep. it, we, we you know this is happening in real time. So like we our farm is not for sale, um, but no. if you're interested, <laughs> <laughs> you know it's we're cons- we're we're considering it. It's the uh, same thing I told Don. I was like, he's like, so is it, you want me to put it for sale? And I was like. No, like I, you know, because we've only had it for a year, like, and we were rarely successful and it produces income. Like, I don't mean, I might not find another farm like that. So, so putting it up for sale and selling it forces me to buy something, which I don't like. Yeah. I don't like being forced to have to buy something. Well, and frankly, I prefer to sell it off market. Uh, just, you know, I, uh, Donna's a good friend and he's a great mm-hmm. agent, but like you know, selfishly, we, we want to uh, preserve as much profit as possible to mm-hmm. roll into, a new farm and stuff. And so I, I think that this, this property is desirable enough that we can sell it off uh, mm-hmm. market and it's, you know, it kind of, it, it speaks for itself. So, uh, a little it's, fizzo so, it's, action. so it's not for sale, you know, but we're, you know, we're, we're considering it. Everything's we also, for sale, Nick. Yeah, that's all. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, we also haven't identified a farm in Kansas yet. So no. that's, a. Uh, uh, basically a stipulation. Uh, we need three identified farms when we do a 1030. We will one. have to have identified farms prior to accepting mm-hmm. an offer on, on our 45 farm. days to identify three of them. So, you know, we'll see um, if anybody listening is. This is a whole different complexity level than we've ever dealt with. Yeah. Um, you know, frankly, we had Madison who did my timber to go out and look at that timber. Uh, yeah. And there's sub- substantial black walnut. Like, we could cut some black walnut off there and make money now. Um, but if somebody would buy it and hold on to it for seven or eight years, like they're going to cut some substantial black walnut off of that property. Right. From an income source. What did he think? Did he say there was like 30,000 that could come off right today? now? And that would be even in a select, like he wouldn't clear cut it, right. but that would thicken up some of those timber patches that are primary bedding right now, which obviously is our end goal anyways. So, I mean, talk about meat on the bone on this Illinois farm. It's like, and I'm not just trying to sell it. It's like, First and foremost, I'm looking forward to that for us, you uh-huh. know, this this coming year or for uh-huh. years to come. But if we happen to sell it, you know, I think we can feel really good about giving somebody a farm that uh, that they'll be able to benefit from and profit from down the road, too. Yeah, no, it's it's tough. I, the hard part is, is like, you know, and I, I can't tell you how many times I've had the conversation in the last three months is like, yeah, I'd sell that farm, but I don't know what I'd buy. And that's the that's the hurdle. Yeah, well, that's, you know. That also is what's uh, keeping us from taking it to market is we're like, dude, we had so much trouble finding this one to begin with. Like mm-hmm. it's, it required so much effort that it's like, uh, we're going to have to do that again. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and hopefully we've made, you know, some context between, 
you know, between now and then that uh, I, I'm confident that we will be able to find something there. I mean, it's like I've, I've seen quite a sure. few that would be of interest and we've got some guys looking for us and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but you Yeah, know. and does that mean we want to do it this year? Do we want to see how the beans play out this year and hunt it? I don't know. Well, I, I would love to have both, right? Like if, I, <laughs> if we were just made of money, yeah, I wouldn't sell this farm. I'd, just sure. buy, I'd buy another one. But obviously... Financially, that that can't happen. We need to kind of keep uh, keep rolling it into what makes sense. And like, if you know, if we lose money at the end of the day, you know, my wife is not going to have that. So, no. and also, we wouldn't do it, right? There's other ways to gain access to hunting ground. Um, yeah, we hunt Kansas as many times as we can, and without yeah, without. you know, this big upfront investment and stuff. But you know, so so we do that in the hopes of of turning a profit off it someday when you know, or for it being a good investment in that sense. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're doing. And I, you know, I hope that the transparency kind of pays off. It's like, uh, I know a lot of people want to critique and be like, well, what would you buy it for? And what are you selling it for? And this and that. And it's like, it's worth what it's worth, you yeah. know? And it's like, I, I think we can feel good about selling to some, somebody, even one of our listeners uh, or close friends of ours, knowing how much meat is on the bone and how much potential we're mm -hmm. leaving there. Uh, just mm -hmm. frankly, in pursuit of, of the next thing. And if not, we'll be there this year. Uh, you know, and enjoying all of that for ourselves. Yeah. So it's a, it's a good situation to be in it is. You know, for us. Yeah. I mean, selling is the hardest. Like I've, I've bought a bunch of farms. I haven't sold any yet. <laughs> yeah. 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 So yeah, it's a, that's a new flip on, on my end for sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's hard to, well, I guess I, Don kind of caught us off guard cause I was just floating it out there of like, Hey, you know, we were thinking about Kansas. Like, I don't know, like what, you know, do you think we could sell it? And he was like, yeah, n no problem <laughs> for, for whatever, seven to 7,500 an acre. And I'm like, oh, whoa. Like, yeah, that's substantial. Yeah. Right. And even our appraisal came back. We had, we had, I think our appraisal came back at a thousand or a million fifty. Um, so we immediately had instant equity, which is what we want. Right. So it, you know, those are the things that are kind of all roped together where it's like, we got a deal on this place. It's got, amazing opportunity we could sit on it for another two years and probably it will continue to appreciate and we could take timber off of it and we kill more bucks on it um but in two years will we miss an opportunity in kansas and i don't know that answer yeah um yeah well and i cited too because you know we're, as we're uh working through this like we we uh you know relationships are really important to mm -hmm. us and, and networking stuff so when we when we do inevitably sell this place eventually, I think it's important to us. Like we, we want to be involved as much as the, the sellers are, are you know, want to have us, mm -hmm. you know, whether that's a consult or, you know, breaking down the numbers of how we're doing monthly payments and, mm -hmm. and working with the farmers and stuff like that. I, that's kind of part of the deal. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? We do that for anybody, you know, stick around and, um, and, and share kind of our strategy with that stuff. But that's, uh, that's exciting too. It's like, I, I know we're always sure. looking to connect with people. And so if somebody wants to buy the farm, we can, we can partner on that level. Yeah. So yeah, that's kind of the gist of that. We don't know. We don't know what we're doing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, it is. Uh, I've I do. Seen, know, I do know things happen fast, though. So like, I do. In a very real sense, I mean, like, the the right, you know, one or two farms in Kansas could come up, like mm -hmm. in the next week or two, mm -hmm. legitimately, mm -hmm. and we may at that time say, okay, you know, we've obviously had conversations about you know putting feelers about uh, considering selling and stuff, but I mean. If we had to, we, we could make that happen very quickly. Mm -hmm. So crazy, man. Yeah. It's, uh, the, the challenge is, be, and I think it's because, you know, the farm is what it is. It's like, you have to ask yourself the question of like, you know, what, what else could you buy for a million dollars basically? And, you know, if you look in a, another farm in Illinois, it's about the same. If you look in Kansas, it's like, I can buy double the acreage potentially, you know, if I looked in, if I took that to Kentucky, I could buy a thousand acres with it. You well, know? it's an interesting conversation, dude, because you, you know, we're talking about maxing, maximizing our money basically from, uh, you know, for us to get the best, uh, situation possible. Mm -hmm. so, so that's, you know, we want to hunt big buck. We want to mm -hmm. hunt big bucks. Like, mm -hmm. it's, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's pretty straightforward. We want to hunt big bucks. We also want to get a return on our investments. So we want the property to, you know, either produce income during the time that we own it or appreciate to the point where we can mm -hmm. profit after the sale and after, uh, uh, interest is paid and everything yep. like that. You could easily take, you know, so we're talking about selling this farm for, you know, in a neighborhood of, of one, two, yep. right. You could take that and, and look across the country and say, what could you buy? What could I, yeah. What could I buy? So what you're just saying there, you could waste that money quickly as yeah. you know, quicker than you could blink your eyes. You know, you go to 
and I'm not, I can't just make generalizations about states and stuff sure. like that, but like use Ohio, for example, you know, it's like, man, if I, with $1.2 million, I could probably buy a hundred acres, mm. a, a, a 150, 150 to 200, 150 to 200. In most cases, if you're down in Southern Ohio, you could probably get three to four. Okay. You know, and so now just weigh that against the potential for, you know, so we're, we're looking at this whole situation and saying, hey, we, we think Kansas is where that mm -hmm. money would be best spent for us, mm -hmm. for our objectives. Um, granted, there would be some huge benefit to having land in Ohio. It's two hours, two away, hours. as opposed to, yep. you know, 17 hours. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, if the goal is to kill big bucks, like on 200 acres, mm -hmm. frankly, yeah, you're a struggle. Tough. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. It absolutely, absolutely mm -hmm. can be done. Well, has been done. I think also it's the demand. I mean, think about how often does a 200 acre farm come up in Ohio that's not like multiple people wanting to to buy it. The right farm, right? A lot. Never. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're always bought. Yeah, and so whereas in Kansas, like these bigger ranches and bigger chunks are probably less purchased because of where it is. It's it's there's less people there. You know, the, the density of people is dramatically less than it is in Ohio. Same with Illinois. It's well, like, yeah. how many times does a 150 acre, like really good whitetail farm come up in Illinois that doesn't have multiple bids on it? it they all do. They all do. Mm -hmm. it, it just because of the demand for that. Uh, yeah. I mean, as a, as a general rule of thumb, again, another generalization, but I want to say like, if you want to, if you want to kill big bucks or, or hunt older age class of bucks, you need to go to where people aren't mm -hmm. or where they the hunting restrictions are such that they can't, right. that they can't. Iowa can't. efficiently. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Not rocket science. Yeah. And even where we're at in, in West Central Illinois, like there's people, but not nearly as dense people as you would even when you get to the Southern or Eastern part of the <sighs> Illinois. Here would be the other situation. You know, let's say you do use that million bucks to mm -hmm. buy property in Ohio. And let's say in two to three years, you know, by whatever means they decide Baiting, you know, baiting, baiting's gone. Baiting's got to go. Your property will appreciate astronomically. I, not in the first year or two, because you, I, but, I do think there's an experience, uh, you know, loss of hunters and stuff yeah. like that. It, they'll stagnate and hunters will leave yeah. temporarily. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but pretty quickly the quality will be made back up to the point where it's just as good from a hunting standpoint as have, Kansas or Iowa. You need to have a substantial amount of property. You're not going to kill big Ohio bucks on ten acres. Right. Yeah. Right. Unless you're in like Columbus or Cincy. Right. Well, I mean, even there, it's, it's the baiting that pulls them in. Yeah. It's tough. You know? So yeah, you gotta, you gotta be set up with a larger amount of acreage to do that. So, you gotta have food so you, you know, there you go. I don't, yeah. I'm not saying that we, you know, someday we just sell mm -hmm. that Kansas farm and roll that into an Ohio farm. It's like, but we're mm -hmm. chasing, uh, and frankly, that would be amazing because it's, yeah. the distance is much more manageable. I would yep. way rather drive two hours to hunt what I want to hunt than 17 hours. Yeah, but just the regulation in Ohio is set up such that like it's that is not going to happen until mm -hmm. a regulation change is made. Well, and transparently, we can kill one buck in Ohio, and we have other places to hunt in Ohio right now. Another another consideration for sure. You know, so like if we didn't, if we had no places to hunt in Ohio, I would assume that we yeah. we probably be would be looking. We'd be looking, despite that reality. Exactly, because of the amount of time we'd be able to spend on the property. Mm. That's the di distance is the biggest factor, you know, and even with Illinois, it's, you know, it's nine and a half, I think from us to, to our Illinois farm. Um, you know, that distance is a hurdle, but it's not an insurmountable hurdle by any means. Um, you know, 17, 17 tough. is a tough one. 17 stuff. Yeah, we don't have a private plane, <laughs> no, you know, or a helicopter. Yeah. It's 17 is a stretch. I mean, you go out and you, you shed hunt it and you come back and you get it set up for the season and you're back for the season yeah and that's about it which it is what it is you know it's like uh you know we are fortunate to have a few places to hunt and it's like you man i can't i can't survive on that little time mm -hmm. on a property mm -hmm. you know but that's why it's what the ohio farm is for right and that's you what have uh, them in the back pocket yeah is you know i we spent a considerable amount of time on the the farms that are close to home here yep. and uh but you know, when you want to go to the land of giants, you know, a few times a year and, and capitalize on your, mm -hmm. your time and your money. Well, and again, it's also, <clears throat> it, it seems like a more solid investment. Like if you, if you had a million dollars, what you could get in Ohio 
from an appreciation standpoint, it's probably not nearly as good as what you can in Kansas. I would say from an income production side, what we could buy in Ohio is probably not going to be nearly as good as what we have in Illinois. A predicting a predicted income. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's dude, nobody could have seen the oil and gas boom coming right. like in Eastern central Ohio. Yeah. Um, and it's made, you know, a lot of people like a, a ridiculous amount yeah, of millions. millions. Yep. Um, and it's just farm ground. Yep. Right. So yeah, that's you never, a hard one. you never know, you know, what's kind of coming down the pipe and yeah, what's out there. I mean, I would have said that when I bought my Ohio place, I didn't know there was that much timber on it that I could take off. Well, yeah. So those are different though. Cause like you could have, I could have, you could have, and you, maybe you could make an argument that somebody could have seen this oil and gas boom mm -hmm. come. And I'm sure some people did and they bought yeah, land. Some and, people knew. Yeah. You know, and it's Pelosi and stuff. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so, but you can't make investment decisions on the exception. Yeah. Right. You know, uh, that's why we look at appreciation and, or whatever the current annual production is of, of revenue. Yeah. Well, and frankly, you know, deer hunting is not a sure thing either. I mean, no, nothing is, you know, I mean, you know, timber could get a blight, mm -hmm. uh, deer could get CWD and mm -hmm. get wiped out mm -hmm. and, you know, all these different resources that like are, you know, major contributing factors, the primary market drivers, like they, they, those resources could go away. They are affected by they could go away. sources. And so we, you know, that's an important consideration for us is we're looking at making a large investment like this is like, man, how, how do we, mm -hmm. how do we make, how do we make it a safe investment too? Well, yeah. And the I mean, CWD thing, I mean, it's worth, uh, you know, on another podcast, at least it sounds like we're going to try to rally some troops for like a round table mm -hmm. between Dr. Deer and like, mm -hmm. uh, whoever we can rope in to learn more about that. I know we've talked about it. Yeah. In the we future. won't, we won't both pull our, you know, the polls of <laughs> on you. some of the hunter podcast stuff, but we, yeah, I mean, do that. Who knows? You know, I mean, I I know there's guys that literally will say it's it's not real, like mm -hmm. it's uh, it's fagazi, fagazi, fagazi. But then at the same time, you know, there are guys who are adamant that it will eliminate all deer in North America, like within a 20, 30 year frame mm -hmm. frame period. And that obviously is like not something that I think we can prove right now, but it is maybe something we consider when you're buying recreational properties. Like I mean, that that, that is that would the certainly downfall. hurt the value, right? When you when you talk about how these things are linked, and this was kind of the discussion I had with these guys in West Virginia the other day, is like when you talk about recreational values, um, that is not as stable as something like tillable value for crop production. Like they need that land to produce crops. Period. Well, and dude, even tillable. I mean, we're, maybe we're getting a little bit off the rails here, but I'm fine with it. You know, you look at like the, uh, you know, societal movements towards investment in like tillable lands. And no, things. food. Yeah, food sources. Like, yeah. and how how farming is done and stuff. I mean, it's like, you know, ten years ago, whatever, we would have said like, well, you know, the staple of American food is is farming, sure. right? And domesticated animals and stuff like that. It almost seems like there's a there's a push, especially from. Uh, you know, I don't know who necessarily, I guess I would say like more on a democratic, mm. you know, on the, on the left side of things is, is, or maybe not even that, I don't know. Maybe it's like from a, from a world economy standpoint, looking at centralized currencies and, you know, non, you know, uh, is it non me or is it non, you know, wh which of those things are essentially like, uh, not at risk or, or threatened and stuff. Like mm -hmm. it just almost seems like we're, we're going in a place where it's like, you know, you'll have, you'll, you'll have uh, centralized and tightly managed currencies mm -hmm. and food that's essentially like, you know, grown by only, you know, the largest organizations that whether they sure. do that on land with land usage or not, it's, mm -hmm. I don't know. That's, that's like a, a whole future world thing where we're like, how does that affect land and land ownership today? Well, yeah. Cause I mean, you look at some of these places like in Illinois where we're at or in Iowa, they're selling ground at twenty thirty thousand dollars $30,000 an acre for tillable land. It's like, how do you ever make a return on that investment? Yeah. Well, with the, you know, with the current returns. So there's, that's what I'm saying is there's something happening there. It's like in, in, you know, I don't know, maybe we have a farmer on to break down the math and stuff, but like, it, boy, yeah. Seems How? like, like your, uh, your overhead is way too high. Like there's no way that you're profitable. So you see the people that are buying property, you know, acknowledging that these are mm -hmm. large capital groups, you know I mean? Ma massive massive. Uh, amounts of money that, you know, probably can afford to not make money on the property for some period of time, but have some intended future use, mm -hmm. 
Yeah. That I, we don't know what it is. Yeah. That's where you can get down the hole of like the BlackRock groups and all that. What is, a, yes, what is that? So it's just like a giant investment Capital fund. group? Yeah. Based out of? Uh, probably New York would be my guess. Okay. So it's made up primarily of Americans, like mm. United States. Like, you know, if you, I'm sure people are familiar with like Vanguard funds, yeah. right? So Vanguard, you invest funds in Vanguard managed portfolios. Same with BlackRock. BlackRock okay. has BlackRock funds that you would... And so that is the that is the controller of wealth, right? When you invest money, it goes into a BlackRock fund. BlackRock then invests in in your money into the different funds, and you know, win or lose, that's how that's how it goes. And so, you know, when they start to look at some of these portfolio type things, like those are where those movements are. Those are the guys that are master puppeteering this whole thing because mm-hmm. um, they're controlling the wealth. You know, it's it's the it's these hedge well, funds. Th- and, yeah, they're trying and, to make money for their. Uh, yeah, but it's all, you think about it, for the most part, it's all paper money, right? Like most of these people are never taking their money out. They're never cashing it out. They're rolling it into other stocks. and It's all paper money, right? Does it actually exist? Like if everybody asks for their right. money back out of these funds, like it doesn't exist. Right. Can't. Right. So right. like those are the way when you start to look at the, how things are being leveraged and these, you know, these paper trail money type opportunities that are being leveraged from a hedge fund or from a capital group or whatever, it's like, and it gets dicey, you know, and that's where devaluation of currency and things like that comes into play. Cause it's like, you know, we're just producing money, you know, left right. and right. That did the, uh, yeah, that, that stuff's way over my head, frankly. But, uh, like when it comes to like world economy and paper money stuff, it's like, man, it, it seems like, you know, you look at the United States, it's like, you could interpret that as like, we have no money. We have no money. Mm-hmm. Like we're, Tri- whatever it is, trillions of dollars in debt. And uh, yeah, we continue to make money and give it to other countries. And it's interesting how <laughs> like that. How can you give money when you're that far in debt? To who? Who are you in debt? Who are you in debt to? Well, and it's also like what money? And the answer is like, well, we just print more. Yeah. Which so is that's how you continue. Well, to that's go where into debt. it's like you know the the primal or like uh, it's not like we owe a trillion dollars to China. Right. Like they didn't give us a trillion dollars. Who are we in debt to? I mean, lots. lots of people, good question. I'm sure. I'm sure we. I bet we are trillions of dollars in debt to China. I so, don't know. And, and it probably would be in exchange for like goods and mainly goods, right? So they send us product, and we are in debt to. I don't know. I don't know. That's over my head. This is like a <laughs> one of those people can chime in after the fact and tell us why we're wrong. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I would assume we're in debt because we keep taking well. It's you know, it's interesting loans against money that doesn't exist. Well, the money, the the money thing is weird because it's just literally is a printed piece of paper that we all acknowledge Mm -hmm. and say like, this is worth something, Mm -hmm. you know, but it's not, at least I don't think it's backed by anything anymore. Like there was a national reserve, right? Where you have, what what was there? It was backed by what? I think gold. Okay. So, but it's just not, it's like uh, the same amount of gold, right? Like we don't have more, we're not putting more gold into this. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I don't know either. Yeah, I don't know. This is the fun part of the conversation. And this in Fort Knox. So that's what I'm saying. It's like it's all like Yeah. Seemingly made up. It is to, It's a treasury. Treasury, yeah. So to, to to back it up though, it's kinda like so what hard assets do you have? Yeah. I guess personally and like as a country, I guess is kind of the level we're talking at now. Mm-hmm. And who can you f- fight? Yeah. But it it comes down at the end of the day, it's like, well, I'll beat you up. Like yeah. that's, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that, that's where like, you know, and it, I'm not picking on them by any means. Cause I'm obviously like our country in debt. <laughs> um, but like when you hear people talk about like, you know, I'm debt free or whatever, and I own a vehicle and I own a small house and it's like, that's awesome. You're debt free. You don't have any mortgages. Like yep. you're not paying anything, but like those assets, like, w- could you have done something different with that money? Could you invested in more land or other assets that, yeah, maybe you have debt against them, but are going to continue to appreciate and have well, tangible value. They, yeah, they will, but that barrier to entry is so high because of that initial down payment. Well, no, you have to buy it with cash for that to be a reality because mm. the bank owns it. Mm-hmm. You just pay, you just put some money up front mm-hmm. to collateralize it, mm-hmm. or you, you collateralize your cash and you're making payments. But what if the banking system goes down? Which is what? Fair question. Yeah. Well, because you, as individuals, you're at the risk of uh, 
repossession by the bank. But if the banking system goes down, who's repossessing it? This, that's what I'm saying. It's a good question. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, it's, I, a, it's the same question as if like I'm on the deed. There's a mortgage filed yeah. with the the county as well. But if I pull the deed up, the bank's not on there. Uh, right, right. It's the same question uh, with um, taxes, like in a way, Ugh. in the sense where you I'm know, disgusted with taxes right now. Well, you see a lot of people who are like. You are know, we all going to just get together and stop? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Taxes. Well, that's 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 what a lot like you know people will say. You know, so some people are like, "Hey, I'm going to stop funding the institution." Mm -hmm. This is the first time I'm really considering it, but it's like it's almost like uh, just like it doesn't seem like that can work because they they're the ones that print and control it with the national mm -hmm. treasury. Like it, it seems like they could just be like. Well, that's where the whole electronic banking thing gets dicey because it's like, can they just seize my bank account? Like, if I have the money to pay them and I just choose not to pay them, can yeah. they just seize my bank account? Uh, absolutely, they can. Yeah. I would say they can do that now. Yeah. Essentially. Mm -hmm. You know, they come in with a... Well, and it's not like, you know, go down further the rabbit hole. It's not like the bank has your money. Like, if right. I have $100,000 in the bank and I show up today and say, hey, I want my hundred grand, they don't have it. It, it takes three to four days to get that money sure. into the bank in order to give it to me. Sure. Where'd it go? <sighs> yeah. It Unbelievably got, it complex. Got, got lent out to other people of which they make interest on. This This is a big spot. In fact, I had a good discussion with somebody the other day. Um, we've talked about, you and I are at the same banking uh, yeah. system. And they asked me, they're like, well, how much money are you making on your, on your, uh, your checking accounts and stuff? I was like, none. I was like, I think they charge me to have my money in their damn bank. And they're like, that's bullshit. Call them up. Tell them you want, you want the best interest rate they can give you on their money. Because they're using your money to lend out to other people that they're making, you know, substantial interest rates now. Of which, essentially, I could demand to have 4% interest on my money. Yeah, well. Or I'm going to change banks. You can do it through your bank. Or, I mean, like, I, so I just keep very little cash mm -hmm. in the bank. Mm -hmm. I put it in money markets. I keep operating funds, yeah, in the bank. And then mm -hmm. I... I'll move any additional cash that I have either into a money a money market if I need it mm -hmm. liquid mm -hmm. or the stock market or to hard assets like land. Yep. Yeah, it's it's a big question that people don't realize and don't ask. And the reality is, is if you have $50,000 in your bank account, that money's been lent out to other people of which the bank is making money on and you're not. Yeah, and frankly, you're losing money by having it in there because the bank's, you know, the country's printing more of it every day. Inflation is like... the you know, st it's stealing from the American people. Mm -hmm. You know, when they print money, it makes your money less valuable. Yeah, so I was in the grocery store the other day. A bag of apples was nine fifty. Wow! For a bag of apples, what? Dude, it's crazy. It's not nine fifty. It's it's yeah, dude. Me and my girlfriend split groceries every week. We hundred fifty dollars a week. Oh my god! And we go to Aldi and we eat like yep. birds. I mean, look at me. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> sure. Jeez, dude, it's nuts. It, and it it it's really crazy. It well, really and those are the things between inflation and all that. That's can, that's another driver. People, you know, are like bitching about land prices. It's like, dude, it's they're going to keep going up. Well, As everything else costs more, so will that. It's just that is inflation. It, yeah, it can't happen forever. I mean, so, something's got to break. Like, because it's on both ends. Like, your dollar is worth less the more of it that they print. And things are also more expensive. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's like just the distance is greater and greater. Yeah. yeah. To a point where, I mean, yeah, you see a, a lot of people are struggle busing right now. Yeah. Bad. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. Cost of living is insane. There was a uh, an article I read, 50% of people that are under the age of 30 still live at home. Wow. 50%. Wow. That's well, crazy. In America. Holy cow. Mom, where's the meatloaf? <laughs> wow, that's nuts. That's a crazy high number. Probably because they can't afford it. I it, mean, that, that's it. Rental, rental costs are outrageous, you know, and obviously barrier to entry to buy a home is even crazier right now. So it's yeah. just. If you didn't do it before COVID, it's damn wow. near impossible. <laughs> it is wild. I mean, it's just like uh, we were talking with Dan, you know, on the, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, anecdotal stuff. It's like, this is just in our lifetime. Like, I assume there's been times where it was, you know, you know, talk about the great depression yeah. and stuff like that, or, yep. I mean, yeah, even, when interest rates, even in 2008, I mean, I was like 10 yeah, when, the, when that when happened, crashed, 15 in the eighties, interest rates for a house were 15 to 16%. Yeah. But not, yeah. the cost of a house at that point was 30 grand. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Not 200. <sighs> Boy. 
crazy. The real estate market is is crazy right now. Uh, like in two ways. Like you know, one, it's just it's so pent up because of like all the stuff we're talking about with interest rates so high, and land and home values also at like an all time high. It's just like there is no there's very little movement. Very, I think twenty twenty three saw the fewest transactions in real estate that we've seen since, uh, I, I don't know, sometimes sometime in the nineties or eighties. It's, it's been, a, it's been a long time, um, since transaction yep. numbers were that low. Mm -hmm. And that's because like, again, <laughs> if you're going to sell, you're going to get a mortgage that's likely substantially higher than you have now. What are you going to yeah, buy? Cause there's is. no inventory. It's a, it's a stalemate at this point. Yeah, but so at some point, it's like, man, where do we... It sounds like they're going <laughs> to... Go? They're not going to change interest rates at the March meeting. They're likely going to change them at the July meeting. Yep. I think is what it is. June June meeting. I don't know. June or July meeting, whenever they have that next one. That would be the next time that we could see an interest rate change, but you're talking about, what, maybe half a point? So, I mean, you're going to go from 7% to low sixes. Mm -hmm. You know, it'll be 2025 before you see fives. Likely. Yep. You know, and you may never, we may never in our lifetime see threes again. Mm -hmm. Hard to say. Which it is what it is. I mean, the interest rate is, you know, it's expensive to, to borrow money, but like the inflation thing mm -hmm. is. Yeah. When everything else costs more, all your expenses on that property are increased as well. Yeah. It's not good. Mm -mm. It's not good. Makes land ownership a tough thing. It's not for everybody. And that's, I would say, you know, wrap it up with this is like, and ownership is not for everyone. There's a big barrier to entry. It is expensive. Uh, and as secure as we try to make this sound and, and encourage you guys to get involved if you're interested in it, it's risky. There's always a risk to it. You, you could outpunt your coverage and be in a bind on a mortgage payment or something or have to do a fire sale because you lose your job. Like there are a lot of risky aspects to land ownership that are not for everybody. Um, but if you can feel secure in a lot of the places that you are right now and be able to afford that down payment and be able to cash flow the mortgage. Um, the reality is it's probably one of the more stable investments, I believe, at least over the next five to 10 years. I, past that, who knows? But at least over the next five to 10 years, that thing is going to appreciate. Um, you can improve it. You could monetize from it, from timber or oil and gas or CRP or crops, whatever. The reality is, is like it's, it's an awesome investment that could yield major returns and it's a tangible investment, which to me is, it's hard to put a price on any of us being here tomorrow. Um, I can walk out on that farm and enjoy it today. I can't do that with a piece of stock paper. Which is uh, probably increasingly important as the world is burning around us, you know, have a piece of land to plant your boots on and, <laughs> and enjoy it in the meantime. Something else, man. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, that's, you know, are there better investments out there? Absolutely. Um, is there a in terms of rate of return, rate of return, is there a better investment to where you can actually enjoy life and probably not from a stability standpoint, I sure wouldn't put it in timeshares and stuff like that. Um, right. you know, I think the land is, is that stable train that's just kind of going and jump on board. Yeah. Well, and you know, we're not investing experts by any means, like this is not financial advice, but like for us, you know, it's. It's our lifestyle. Well, we, we basically have paper investments, mm -hmm. you know, as just kind of a... Yeah, we're diversified. As a baseline. We we own land in mm -hmm. our homes. Mm -hmm. You own more land than I do, but, you mm -hmm. know, you've been at it for, for more than I have. Mm -hmm. And, you know, thirdly, like if you're looking for places to invest money, like we, uh, our own businesses has been, you know, in terms of like rate of return, that's what yep. we've turned to. So yep. we're, we're like, hey... We've done a lot of that. Money either gets invested into stocks, it gets used to buy land, mm -hmm. or it gets invested into businesses that we're actively working in on a day-to-day on mm -hmm. -day basis. And I'll end you with this, is that the businesses that we work in on a day-to-day -day basis and the land that we own, I can put my two hands on it and I can will that into doing things and becoming better and becoming more valuable. I cannot do that with stocks. And that's not saying that I won't invest in stocks because I do, I have diversified portfolio. But there's nothing that burns me up more than some CEO shit in the bed and me losing money. And it doesn't matter how hard I work or what I say, I can't change anything. Well, I'll say this for it, though. You know, in a lot of cases, it's it's growing and you don't have to do anything. Sure. 
you know, and that's that's nice too because the it re- could also be crashing and you're not doing anything. It can definitely. We're going to. We're almost at forty thousand on the market yep. as of today. I don't know where we're at, but we were at like thirty nine something. Yeah. That's like nineteen thousand higher than right before COVID. Mm. Um, I mean, again, to our money discussion of where's this money at and you know paper money, like how high does it go mm-hmm. before it comes down? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, there's there's an element too of like uh, I know we got to wrap up on this. Yeah. We uh, yeah we really do. The uh, the passive element of that is is enjoyable. You know, mm-hmm. it's it's just one of the eggs in the basket. Yep. You know, but um, you you can't do everything. At the end of the day, it's like I I can't run our businesses and improve our properties and mm-hmm. manage my our stock trading and stuff too. So I mean, my you know, stock trading is long term investment. Mine too. Yep, ups and downs, all arounds. Yep. You know, just let it do what it's doing. Um, whereas like our businesses and, and land can be short-term focus, um, opportunities at least. Cool. So I'm good with that. Let's, let's wrap it up. So if you're interested, you you know, you want to talk to us about the farm, I guess, uh, it's not for sale, but it could be for sale. We don't really have like a call to action on that yet. I mean, I guess if you, or you got a Kansas property, want to get a hold of us, like on the website or something like that, or you have a Kansas property, you would consider selling. Um, yeah, reach out to us on the website Mm -hmm. or, you know, Instagram DM and stuff. And, uh, it's the best way. Yeah. Until the next one, we bought a farm. We bought a farm. If you enjoyed listening to this episode of the I Bought a Farm podcast, make sure you check it out every other Thursday night on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, YouTube, and any other place that you might find your favorite podcast.